Brothers, sisters, friends, assalamu alaikum. Before I start, I'd like to dedicate today's speech to a group of sisters who I feel are at times neglected, but really need your support, need your duas, need as much help as you can give them. And these are the, the wives, the sisters, the daughters, the relations of the Bar 113. So I'd like to uh, dedicate today's speech to them. The brother said I didn't really need an introduction. Well, it, it could be argued. I mean, since I arrived in Melbourne, I have been called an extremist, controversial, a supporter of terrorism, suicide bombings, and, and being anti-police. Um, none of that is true. I am actually a British journalist who happens to be a Muslim, and I'm also involved in British politics, and I'm a member of the National Council of the Respect Party, which is headed up by a great friend of uh, Muslims across the world, George Galloway. It's probably best for me to try and define feminism for you today because there are so many misconceptions about the F word. The uh, journalist and feminist Rebecca West said she had never been able to precisely find out what feminism is. She said, I only know that people call me a feminist whenever I express sentiments that differentiate me from a doormat. Um, the Christian fundamentalist, the Reverend Pat Robertson, a man who once ran for president of the United States and actually has the ear of the uh, current president of the United States, Pat Robertson is horrified at the thought of empowered women. We often hear uh, the media criticize our own clerics and have plenty to say about um, our own scholars and their views on women. But this man, and as I say, he does have the ear of the President of the United States, was asked what he thought of feminism. And he said, feminism encourages women to leave their husbands, kill their children, practice witchcraft, destroy capitalism, and become lesbians. <laughs> Nobody has tried to hound the Reverend Pat Robertson out of his job. The term feminism was first used in France in the 1880s by the writer Hubertine Eau Claire to criticize male domination. While doing so, she was staking her claim for women's rights and emancipation, which had been promised by the French revolutionaries, but sadly, uh, they had failed to deliver. Ever since then, the term feminism um, has inspired many movements and continues to do so across the world today. There are those who believe that Islamic feminism is a contradiction in terms, but as, you, uh, as many of you will know, I consider myself to be a feminist. I've been a feminist uh, since I can first remember, um, a tireless promoter of women's rights, and of late, you know, I've be, as you know, I've embraced Islam. I would humbly suggest that the Islamic feminism I'm talking about has nothing to do with those poor, confused sisters like Urshad Manji, Ayan Hirsi Ali and Amina Wadud, who talk endlessly of Islam's need to modernize. I would say to them, if you want to go off and start your own movement, just do it. The Islam you talk about has never and never will exist. Just don't let the door bang you on the way out. They all realize that um, Islamic feminism advocates women's rights, gender equality, and social justice. But now we need to get the message through to the media that Muslim women are not silent, oppressed creatures. Many have now been able to separate the difference between male-dominated cultures and Islamic practice, um, forced marriages on a killings and little or no education for women 
is simply not Islamic. And of course, people often get confused between the concept of forced marriages, which is not Islamic, and arranged marriages. And I know that uh, quite a few critics of Islam say, you know, what is this business of arranged marriages? Well, I was watching Australian TV last night, and there was an advert on the television that if you want to find your number one true love, you pick up your mobile, <laughs> you key in your name and your date of birth, and bingo, you find your number one true love. I tell you what, I think I would go for arranged marriages any day. <laughs> of course, Islamic feminism is subverted on occasions by patriarchal influences and practices in the Muslim world. Some of these men even dare to interpret the sayings and deeds of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, with regards to women by taking verses um, and ayats and hadith totally out of context. But although I'm not a scholar, what I can stand here and say today is there is not a single woman who will go to the hellfire simply because she is a woman. Women, like men, will be judged on their piety and not their wealth, their beauty, their power, their good looks or position in society. There is no gender bias in the language of the Holy Quran. And if you consider the ayat in Al-Hujrat, O oh humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female and made you into tribes and nations that you may know each other, not that you may despise one another. The most honored of you in the sight of God is the most righteous of you. There is nothing in the Holy Quran to say that women must be servile to men, cook the dinner, wash his clothes, or wait on him. Now, I don't want to cause problems in people's marriages. Marriages are, of course, a partnership. And if one of you goes out to work, then the other should do their bit and jigsaw in uh, very nicely. Marriage is a partnership, and the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, made that extremely clear in his last sermon as well as informing men and women they had rights over each other, he also said, all mankind is from Adam and Eve. An Arab has no superiority over a non-Arab, nor a non-Arab has any superiority over an Arab. Also, a white has no superiority over a black, nor a black has any superiority over a white, except by piety and good action. Islamic feminism derives its understanding and mandate from the Holy Quran, which offers a blueprint for the rights and justices of women as well as men. As I say, this might come as a shock to um, some non-Muslims, and to be fair, there has been a great deal of misunderstanding, misrepresentation, and mischief surrounding Islamic feminism. And to be truthful, it's not just the brothers to blame. We must all take part responsibility for allowing outsiders, as well as those in the deen, that women are lesser beings. The Quran states quite clearly that women are equal in spirituality, worth, and education. Our beloved prophet, peace be upon him, clearly revered and adored women for their strengths and their weaknesses. But he insisted that the most important person in the home, when he was asked, is the mother. Not only did he insist it once, he insisted it three times. The first revert to Islam was a woman. The first martyr to Islam was a woman. And the first keeper of the guardian of the first ever Quran in book form was also a sister. Sisters fought alongside the Prophet, peace be upon him, and the companions on the battlefield, as well as tending to the wounded, promoting dower work, and even sacrificing and offering their children as scholars and martyrs of the future. 
During the first three generations of Islam, the role of women were equal to that of men, and they continued to make a great contribution as scholars right up to the 10th century. And they would teach men as well as women. As a feminist, I was aghast at the rights bestowed on Muslim women 1,400 years ago. These are rights which have only come into the gift of Western women in the last century. Inheritance, home ownership, business and trading was inconceivable 100 years ago for our sisters in the West. They couldn't even vote. In fact, looking back at women's rights, about 30 minutes drive from my birthplace in the north of England, there is a grave of a great woman who martyred herself in 1913 to highlight the political injustices of women in Britain. This is just over 90 years ago. Today she would be called a terrorist and probably be carted off to Guantanamo Bay. But for millions of women across Britain, she is a martyr and a heroine. Let me tell you a little bit about the struggle of Emily Davison, which began in 1909. In March of that year, she was arrested while attempting to hand a petition to the Prime Minister, Herbert Asquith. She was found guilty of causing a disturbance and put in prison for a month. Four months later, she was back in jail again for trying to get into a hall where David Lloyd George, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, was making a speech. She then went on hunger strike, and after five days, she was released. As a point of interest, she and a lot of the suffragettes went on hunger strike, and they were force-fed by tubes being rammed down their nasal passages. This was a practice considered so brutal and primitive that it was actually banned because of the suffragette movement. And yet that same practice is being employed in Guantanamo Bay, except the tubes are larger and wider. And the doctor, the American butcher in Guantanamo Bay, who oversees the force feeding of the hunger strikers there, was actually given a medal by George Bush's administration to um, reward him for his work in Guantanamo Bay. The Australian brother, Mamdou Habib, has uh, spoken to me graphically about the force-feeding uh, methods. As I say, it's, it's a practice which was outlawed in, um, in Britain after the suffragette movements, but it didn't... Um, deter Emily Davison at the time, and she received another sentence again for throwing stones at politicians. And a few days after leaving prison for her last sentence, she was back inside again, again for throwing stones. She would often wrap her stones in a piece of paper, which I think will, um, you'll all find interesting, because the stones were wrapped in her favorite words, Rebellion against tyrants is obedience to God. As I say, she continued in and out of um, prison and she realized that the only way that she, was, uh, she would have um, an impact to try and get women the vote was to do some sort of spectacular. And so she in increased the scale of her militant acts, but realized that women, or she felt women, would not win the vote until the suffragette movement had a martyr. And what she did in June 1913, at the most important horse race of the year, the Derby, she ran out onto the course and attempted to grab the bridle of a horse owned by King George V. She was hit and the impact fractured her skull and she died without ever regaining consciousness. It took a full 15 years before all women in Britain got the vote and that was in 1928. 
as a point of interest in the Muslim world, Kenyan, Palestinian, Iraqi, and Pakistani women became eligible to vote in the mid to late 40s, followed a decade later by their sisters in Egypt, Tunisia, Mauritius, Malaysia, and Algeria. Swiss and Portuguese women in Europe had to wait until the 1970s for the privilege. So as you see, the uh, battle for equality is nothing new. Feminists re-emerged as a strong force during the 1970s, and um, as I mentioned the other day, one of the things that they really uh, made an impact in was this uh, disgraceful beauty pageant uh, called the Miss World or the Miss Universe competition, which was all about the sheer exploitation of women's bodies. And we had the competition or the pageant kicked out of Britain. And um, I thought it had long since disappeared until I switched on Australian TV the other night. I've got to stop watching Australian TV. I tell you, I find it quite shocking. <laughs> Um, in fact, one thing that, that made me sigh more than anything else after the so-called liberation of Afghanistan was the emergence of Miss Afghanistan. And there was this poor girl strutting around in a bikini at a beauty competition, and this was hailed as a giant step forward for the liberation of Afghan women. Well, Muslim women and feminist women um, across the world just sighed in disbelief if this was a sign of um, a step forward. Um, we felt, if anything, it was a step back. But as I say, feminists re-emerged as a strong force during the 1970s and 1980s across Europe, Asia and Middle Eastern countries, even though there are some who still believe feminism is purely a Western concept. It is not. But the sad thing about the feminist movement, um, or the Western feminist movement, was that it was very rigid. And they never took into account the special needs of Muslim women, empowered Muslim women, who found themselves in direct conflict with their faith if they followed Western-style feminism. Um, the term Islamic feminism began to be visible in the 1990s in various global locations, including Iran, um, where various uh, empowered women uh, emerged as speakers and writers and authors. Saudi Arabia also produced um, some feminist authors and, and some people might be surprised at that. I have visited Saudi a few times, and I am always amazed at the resilience of the Saudi women. Of course, if you read the media, you know, the Saudi women are quiet, hidden behind uh, walled uh, courtyards and, and never to be seen in public. Of course, this is a, a popular misconception promoted by Islamophobic media. In fact, during the start of the Second Intifada, a wonderful story was told to me by a sister in Jeddah. She said, we were so angry and we wanted to show our solidarity with our sisters in Palestine. We started an impromptu demonstration outside the local masjid after Friday prayers. Of course, such spontaneous action is frowned upon in, the, uh, in Saudi, and the police were called, and they moved in on these sisters who were demonstrating, and as they got closer, the uh, so-called ringleader of the sisters moved forward and said to the policemen, don't you dare touch us. We are Saudi women, and you're not allowed to lay one finger on us. And the policeman looked and he retreated back and they went away and, and uh, were wondering how they could solve this dilemma because uh, these women were demonstrating and demonstrations, as I say, were not um, allowed in, in Saudi Arabia. In the end, the police returned and arrested all their husbands and fathers instead. <laughs> Thank you.
It's a wonderful story, and the sister told me, and the men were carted off to prison, where they uh, were kept for a couple of hours and held until they gave assurances that uh, this sort of behaviour would not happen again. But don't for one minute think that uh, Saudi women are quiet, subjugated creatures. In fact, another story that I can tell that has emerged um, from Saudi, as you know, there is quite a bit of segregation there, and as a result, there are um, women-only banks. And these have been in existence for the last 40 years, which has meant that women have to go and work in banks, and there have been female bank managers. And they've entered a, a very male-dominated arena globally, but they, um, they soon became experts in Sharia-compliant finance and other financial matters. And some of them are now... Uh, international experts in this field and their views and opinions and consultations are regularly sought across the world because they are experts in this, uh, this field. So um, that's something else um, about Saudi women. So hopefully um, we'll have dispelled a few myths there. Uh, Back to um, the, the feminists that have emerged in the Islamic world. Uh, the term Islamic feminism started being used regularly in the 1990s to describe a new um, feminist movement that uh, was actually starting in Turkey. According to Margot Badran from Georgetown University, South African activist Shamima Sheikh employed the term Islamic feminism in her speeches and articles in the 90s. Badran, a senior fellow at the Centre for Muslim Christian Understanding at Georgetown, she specialises in women and gender in Muslim societies. She believes that Islamic fem feminism is, in many ways, far more radical than secular feminism. I don't know if we are more radical, but we do have the perfect mandate, as I said before, for equality within the pages of the Holy Quran, the word of Allah, and there isn't a, a Muslim man alive, as I say, who would be reckless enough to challenge the word um, of God, uh, is, makes it quite clear that uh, women are equal in spirituality, worth and education. And the um, Surah 9, verse 71 of the Quran states that the believers, male and females, are protectors of one another. The Holy Quran maps out a perfect blueprint. And this has not gone unnoticed by Western women, including people like myself, who started reading the Quran after the horrific events of 9-11 and were flawed by the contents. That is why I believe more women in the West today are choosing Islam above any other faith. Everything that the feminists in the 70s strived for is embraced with, uh, within Islam. I believe that Islamic feminism will soon become a global phenomenon and is neither a product of the East or the West. It was created by women for women, sisters across the planet. Some believe that there is a clash between secular feminism and religious feminism, but again, this is largely the concept produced by mischief makers. After all, the thought of solidarity among all women of faith and no faith terrifies some men. In Britain, the secular and religious feminists have proved that they can work together in the anti-war movement, and this brand of sisterhood is nothing short of extraordinary. I have to say I'm slightly disappointed that the anti-war movement isn't as active in um, Australia as elsewhere in the world, and it would be um, encouraging, I think, to see more Muslims taking part in uh, the anti-war movement. It's always good to have friends outside of the deen as well as within. 
And uh, this also goes for, I mean, there are lots of campaigns out there that are designed to help largely um, Muslim people, but unfortunately it's not Muslims that are driving the initiatives through. I'm talking about the campaigns to highlight the atrocities in Guantanamo. David Hicks is coming home shortly. I hope that he isn't gagged. He has a horrific story to tell, as do all the brothers who've been in Guantanamo that I've spoken to. But let us not forget that once uh, David Hicks comes home, there are still up to 500 more brothers left behind in this obscenity, this boil on the face of human rights. 80% of the brothers in Guantanamo are still being held in solitary confinement. I don't know how many of you saw the images of the British sailors who were arrested by the Iranian government for straying into Iran's territorial waters. Uh, the images actually brought back memories of my own arrest at the hands of the Taliban. And I did have a degree of sympathy with the sailors, in particular the, the female um, who seemed to attract a lot of media attention. And I just thought, well, we've both got quite a lot in common. We both went strain into areas that we shouldn't have uh, gone into and, and were arrested for it. But the media outrage was unbelievable when the Iranians portrayed her, showed her on television wearing a hijab. And I thought, where is this outrage coming from? You know, at least she hasn't been shaved, shackled, sodomized, put in an orange suit with a hood over her head. At least nobody has taken videos and put them on YouTube to mock and humiliate them. The worst thing I thought that the Iranians did was allow her to smoke, as we all know smoking is harmful to the health. <laughs> but uh, it, it was quite, you know, quite um, strange to... Uh, to see the double standards emerging, that uh, you know all this moral outrage that uh, our girl has to wear this hijab. As I said before, in Britain, the secular and religious feminists have proved that they can work together in lots of ways, like the anti-war movement. And we Muslim sisters love our largely atheist sisters and there is a mutual solidarity and respect. While we don't want to become secular and they've shown no inclination to embrace Islam, there is a love and understanding that makes the bond special. And I know, for instance, if Tony Blair ever tried to rip the hijab off the heads of French schoolgirls, in the same way that Chirac uh, did in France, I know our secular sisters would march alongside us in protest. I am confident with the solidarity shown on both sides. Outrageous decisions as taken in Turkey, Egypt and Tunisia to tear the hijab off the heads of women there would never be tolerated. Also in Britain, Politically, the secular and Islamic feminists have come together in the Respect Party. I told you before I'm a, a member of that party, um, and I truly believe that uh, our political party will probably be the first one to produce a hijabi-wearing politician in the House of Commons after the next general election. And that is a remarkable sister called Salma Yaqub. There are only two million Muslims in Britain, which accounts for about 8% um, in total. But we are making our voices heard. We are voting in a smart way. We are now becoming um, quite a a power to contend, and uh, there are political parties who are trying to win the Muslim vote. Um, 
Today, there was a, an article from Natasha Stott Despoja, the Australian Democrat spokesperson on foreign affairs. She wrote a very uh, good piece, I felt, in the, uh, the Age about the situation in Guantanamo Bay. I hope that those of you who read the article send her messages of encouragement and other politicians like her who can actually make a difference. And um, I also hope that you can send a strong message out to the, uh, the opposition leader who is uh, using the uh, macho bullying politics uh, uh, to, uh, he's used them to attack me and um, I hope that uh, it's made quite clear to him that, uh, that you won't uh, tolerate that sort of, um, that sort of uh, politics where he is uh, using Islamophobia to try and win political votes. It's cheap exploitation and as I said at a meeting earlier today, this is one Sheila that won't stand for that sort of politics in, uh, <laughs> over here. Going back to um, the respect party and the political importance of, um, of, of Muslims becoming active, uh, we work alongside Christian and Jewish feminists, not to mention Sikh and Hindu sisters who are also united in this diverse sisterhood. We are continuing to build on, on what we have. And I would say that Islamic feminism is responsible for the emergence of some fine women politicians in the making. There have already been uh, documentary evidences of uh, fine women judges, prime ministers, and heads of state. What we need to do now is encourage the next generation of Muslims to become scholars of the caliber which emerged during the first three generations of Islam. Writers, journalists and academics should be given more platforms to discuss the rise of women in the Ummah and their right to share an equal platform with men. And to those of you here today, you know, thank you very much for coming along and listening to this message and I'm really encouraged by the number of uh, brothers who've, uh, who've turned up to listen to what I have to say as well. Um, I find it liberating standing here before you being judged on what I have to say, my mind and my character rather than what I'm wearing, the size of my bust or the length of my skirt. Now you tell me what is more liberating? You look at glossy magazines aimed at uh, youngsters today, and the message is quite clear. If you're not tall, slim, and beautiful, you will be unloved and unwanted. What sort of message does that send out to, uh, to our young people? Islam sends out quite a different message. It's a refreshing message. And I found in Islam a liberation that I never had um, before. I mentioned yesterday about um, the advantages of being a Muslim woman, how you can write out your own marriage contract. I started off talking about, uh, uh, um, about marriages and uh, I, I recently got married um, just a, a few months ago and I uh, wrote out... <laughs> I wrote out my own contract of my hopes and expectations and um, bless him, it didn't deter my husband and he continued. And during the, during the uh, ceremony, the imam asked me three times if I wanted to get married. And I thought if he asks me another time, he obviously knows something I don't know. Why does he keep asking me? Do you really want to marry this man? <laughs> anyway, um, as I say, there are lots of misconceptions about um, Islam, about women in Islam. I hope that uh, for the non-Muslims here that I've dispelled a few myths. 
I hope you've enjoyed uh, listening to what I've had to say as much as I've had telling you, and you've been a fantastic audience. I'm not sure if we've got time for any questions. We do, but please remember, I am not a scholar. I am uh, Islamically just over three years old. Thank you very much. The question is, how relevant is the claim that the West will be flooded with Muslim children due to their height of birth rate? Now, I don't think Muslim children do have a birth rate as far as I know, so I'm assuming that the question is in relation to the parents of those children. Well, I did read somewhere that um, in about 30 years' time, uh, the majority um, of the population of Germany will be Muslims, alhamdulillah. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, there's lots of uh, Islamophobia around, and uh, for, for the origins of this to, to come from Israel, all I can say is uh, pot, kettle, and black. Um, you know, the amount of uh, Jewish people who've been um, really uh, harried um, into going to live in Israel. Um, is quite extraordinary, and in fact, um, a large number of Yemeni Jews who moved to Israel decades ago have now expressed a desire to, uh, to return home. And in fact, I think what the Middle East leaders should do is encourage the return of Jews into the Middle East, back into places like Jordan, Yemen, um, and other countries, where Jews have been able to live peacefully side by side with their Muslim uh, brothers for centuries without uh, the sort of persecution that they had to endure in, uh, in Europe. We have an interesting question from a member of the media, I'm assuming. Um, now, you're, are you familiar with the, some of the discussion going on about our Sheikh, Sheikh Tagdil Halali? Now, I, I personally am not very familiar with the latest developments. I'm not sure if you are as well. But I think the question is, is more in relation to the comment that you made about Pat Robinson not being hounded out of his job. I think members of the media perhaps were reading into that, that you were referring to Sheikh Tag being in some way hounded out of his job. Were you trying to draw any parallels between Pat Robinson in America and our Sheikh, Sheikh Tag in Hanadi here? I actually uh, met the Sheikh during one of my earlier visits to Australia, and it was before I wore the hijab. And I can only speak personally. I found him to be utterly charming and supportive and uh, very encouraging of my journey to Islam. He certainly didn't describe me as a piece of meat, and I think it's um, unfortunate that uh, Sheikh Taj has been um, not so much as misquoted, but perhaps mistranslated. And um, I, I don't know the circumstances of his demise as the Grand Mufti of Australia. I would hate to think that, uh, that he has been undermined and... Um, removed from this position by brothers who are too weak to stand up to government pressure. Um, these are difficult times for all Muslims, and all I would say to Muslims in here today, which is the same as what I say to Muslims around the world, is the great do not seem that great when you stand up. You know, get up off your knees and stand up. Don't run because those enemies of ours will chase you. There's nowhere to hide. You have to stand your ground. Um, you have to uh, look your enemy in the eye, and you can't do it when they have you on your knees. The question reads, how would you like to be a Muslim woman, being one of four wives, living in some faraway town in Afghanistan, where your husband believes you should just stay at home and when he gets sick of you, just throws you out and gets another wife. Well, this was actually a practice stamped out by the Taliban. 
And I have to tell you, I've visited uh, Afghanistan several times, and the, uh, the prison where I was held, um, the last time I was there was jammed, packed with young girls aged 12 to 16, whose only crime is that they had run away from home because they didn't want to be sold off as child brides to men two or three times their age. As I say, this was a, a practice that the Taliban did stamp out. Um, as for polygamy, well, um, I know that uh, there are polygamous marriages um, across the Muslim and the non-Muslim world. It's a personal choice. It's not um, something that uh, I would personally uh, go for, and um, therefore, um, before I married my husband, um, if I did have any offers uh, to be a second or a third or fourth wife, um, the answer would have been no. However, saying that, that there are women who do find, um, find uh, that arrangement acceptable, it's up to them. The whole reason that uh, polygamy um, w uh, was around, my understanding is that um, there were, in the early days, no social welfare systems in place, and if a woman's husband was killed through plague, pestilence, or war, she was basically left high and dry, where the polygamy system did enable her to, um, to go and um, marry and uh, be protected and looked after. Um, as I say, in today's modern world, it's, uh, it's down to choice. I know it works for some women and not for others. Last question, I think, and this is something you touched on yesterday. Um, the question is, how would you respond to the allegation of Stockholm Syndrome? And I'm assuming the question is in relation to yourself, that you're suffering, and you have been suffering from a very prolonged bout of Stockholm Syndrome, sister? Well, I would imagine my captors are probably still being counselled um, from the experience. I was terrified when I was captured by the Taliban. I had bought into the propaganda that this was the most evil, brutal regime in the world. So when they showed me kindness, I thought, what are they up to? Um, I wasn't going to have any of this, and so I decided they're going to kill me anyway, and on the grounds you don't uh, kiss the hand that slaps you, I decided to become the prisoner from hell. I went on hunger strike, I threw things at them, I spat at them, I swore at them, I cursed them. Um, they must have dreaded coming in to see me. In fact, every prejudice that they ever held about Western women, I probably reinforced tenfold. And while there were other Westerners held in Afghanistan at the time, including the wonderful Australian woman, Diana Thomas, um, they released me after 10 days. And I really don't know who was happier to see me go across that border back into Pakistan, the Taliban or myself. And um, to suffer from Stockholm Syndrome, you have to bond with your captors. Um, as you've just heard, there was absolutely no bonding at all. But I will say this. As I walked across no man's land back into Pakistan, I suddenly realized that the men who had held me hadn't been playing games had in fact been honourable, respectful and decent, which often prompts me to say to people, thank Allah I was captured by the most evil, brutal regime in the world and not by the Americans. But something positive also emerged from the rubble and the burning embers of the Twin Towers. Curious Westerners like me descended on bookshops and began buying the Quran and Islamic literature. They wanted to find out what is in this faith that promotes violence, that causes people to hijack planes and fly them into towers. 
and as a result the Quran became the best seller and something else strange also then followed Westerners like me began converting to Islam in huge numbers in Britain alone we've had 14,000 reverts to Islam since 9-11 and the figure continues to grow the trend is repeated across Europe and in America and in Australia and I'm happy to say uh, there is uh, growing evidence in New Zealand as well that more people are embracing Islam and when the Quran was first um, developed uh, as, as a book after 23 years of the message coming through at that period of time Christians were meeting at a conference in Paris to decide if women had souls not if they were equal but if they had souls if they were really human beings so you know um, Islam right from day one was um, groundbreaking for women and yet still women in the West look upon conversions like mine and yours as a complete catastrophe and what I would say to them is please start reading the Quran don't worry I'm not Islam's answer to Billy Graham I'm not out to convert people but what I would like to do is rip away that veil that those women and men wear that um, is a veil of prejudice and bigotry towards Muslim women and towards Islam in general. And then I thought, oh, I've been caught. So I took my camera off and I handed it to him and then I closed my eyes waiting to be shot in the head. And when I opened my eyes after a few seconds, he'd gone. He'd gone over to the man who hired the donkeys. He wanted to know who is in charge of this woman. And then he would get to the bottom of the camera. I was delighted. I thought I can get away. He still doesn't realize that there's a Westerner under the burqa. And I turned and went to attach myself to another group to follow them over the border and he asked me to write down my personal details and telephone contacts to prove that I was a journalist. After I had done that he said we are about to eat you must have something to eat and I said well that's very kind but I need to use the telephone first and he said no you can't use the phone so I said, in that case, I won't eat either as a guest or a prisoner of the Taliban until I can use the phone. And what started then was the war of attrition, which was to last 10 days. Now, you would think that the most evil, brutal regime in the world couldn't care less if one of their prisoners had gone on hunger strike. But these men were very, very upset. Despite my protest saying I'm not eating every morning noon and night they would bring me food they would lay out a cloth on the floor beautiful carpeted floor by the way and uh, they would put down some bread some stew and um, some rice and they would bring in a jug of water and a bowl and they would wash my hands and they would tell me in broken English, you are our sister, you are our guest, we want you to be happy. And I thought, what sort of evil, brutal regime is this? Don't they understand the job description? And I'm thinking, you know, this is just a trick. They're trying to soften me up. And then the really bad guys will come in with the electrodes. In fact, isn't it strange? Everything that I thought would have happened to me under this so-called savage primitive regime happened to um, prisoners in Abu Ghraib, in Guantanamo Bay, and other US holding facilities. 
which always prompts me to say, thank God I was captured by the most evil, brutal regime in the world and not by the Americans. And on June the 30th in 2003, at 11.30 in the morning, I took my Shahada and declared my belief that there is only one God and that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is his messenger. This brother was hauled off, held for four days, and the only piece of evidence that was thrown at him was the Muslim directory, what is this? What is this about? And he was warned by his lawyer, whatever they do and say to you, don't laugh. He said, do I look as though I'm in a mood to laugh? And they said, really, everything has been taped. If you laugh, it could count against you. And he's thinking, what do they mean? And he said his first reaction when they threw down the yellow pages was to burst out laughing because it was nothing more than a directory. But it was a Muslim directory. And the media is as much to blame. We've had hysterical headlines about Al-Qaeda cells in Scotland ready to blow up the New Year celebrations. And um, about nine, ten Algerian brothers were rounded up and this was uh, really scary headlines. Then a few days later, they were all given the bail that a common shoplifter would get and they all had their passports returned. And then a few weeks after that, all the charges were dropped. There was no truth in the story at all. But the headlines remained in people's memories and not even a paragraph to say it was all a load of rubbish and they've all been freed. America, the greatest superpower in the world. In the 1920s, it wanted to ban alcohol and it brought in prohibition. The greatest superpower in the world, the biggest army, the most powerful, the most money, and it wanted its people to stop drinking. And it couldn't. It couldn't control its own people. Then they look at Islam. And I'm looking around here and I'd like to bet that there isn't a single person in here who drinks. Why? Not because somebody's put a gun to your head and said you can't drink. Not because somebody said that uh, if you take a drink you'll be fined $50. You do it out of the fear of Allah, out of your faith, your religion. And this terrifies the Americans. Well, what I would like to know is if America is such a peaceful nation, why has it been at war every single year for the last 50 years? Trying to civilize countries and bring democracy across the globe. During this dark period of history, more than 20 countries have been bombed by America. Starting in 1945, China, then Korea, Guatemala, Indonesia, Cuba, Belgian Congo, Dominican Republic, Peru, Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia, Lebanon, Libya, El Salvador, have I said Nicaragua? Iran, Libya, Panama, Iraq, Kuwait, Somalia, Croatia, Bosnia, Iran, Sudan, Afghanistan, Yugoslavia, and of course back over to um, to Iraq again. And that list doesn't include the sort of military recklessness which is becoming common in the United States. Like in Italy in 1998, when 200 people were killed by a US warplane as they traveled in a cable car. Or in China in 2001, when a Chinese military pilot was killed by a spy plane collision. And that doesn't include the proxy bombings of Iraq by Israel in 1981 using the US-made F-15 bombers and the brand new F-16 fighter bombers either. And let us not forget that America is the only nation in the world to have used nuclear weapons on civilian populations twice. 
as the survivors of Nagasaki and Hiroshima will be bearing testament in the anniversary in the next few days. America, as we all know, has weapons of mass destruction. More than 2,000 nuclear warheads and chemical and biological weapons, as well as some very nasty top secret weapons. One of the reasons it was going into Iraq was to find weapons of mass destruction and chemical weapons. Of course, we know there were no WMD in Iraq. But isn't it ironic that the US Marines have been using chemical weapons to subdue the Iraqi population? The latest arsenal they've used is a very nasty napalm type of weapon called MK-77. And they used that in the fight in Fallujah. One Islam Productions, an Islamic film studio established in Australia, is dedicated to producing films for all Muslims. Just some of the films by One Islam Productions. Children's programs, Islam for Me, We Remember Allah, Storytime and more. Educational films, Pray As You Have and Seen Me Pray, to lead Words, Ramadan, Renewal Next. of Faith. Documentaries. We at One Islam Productions believe that Islam is precious and deserves to be presented in only the highest quality. Visit us at www.oneislam.net for more information. One Islam Productions, a film production company run by Muslims for Muslims. I'm sorry,